guest is Father Edward Perrone. Father Perrone is a co-founder of Opus Bono Sarcedoti. Welcome, Father. Thank you, Dave. Uh, let's start with a Latin lesson on uh, Opus Bono. Uh, is it Sarcedoti? Is that your soccer? I'm not sure Sarcedoti. how to do it. Sarcedoti, yeah, it's kind of a tongue twister. So it's Satcher, not... Right, okay. Sarcedoti, right. Now, I know that Joe and Pete started a company that was called Opus Bono, which was good works. But then when you add Sacerdote E to it, it becomes a <coughs> whole sentence rephrased. Can you? Yes, well, opus means work. Bono would mean two or four something, a good. Okay. Work for a good. Uh, it doesn't really modify opus because it would have to be opus bonum. Okay. Latin is very you know, particular about the endings of words. And then Sacerdote is of the, of the priesthood. So it's. Um, a, uh, a possessive case, if you will, in Latin. So that's how those words have to be exact. You know, opus bono sacerdoti, work for the good of the priesthood. Okay, terrific. Um, you are a priest of the Diocese of Detroit and a pastor of a parish. Tell us about your parish and parish life. Okay, I, uh, my parish is Assumption Grotto Church. It's called the Grotto because we have a Lourdes Grotto in... Um, in the lot behind our parish, in the, in, the, in the cemetery, the parish cemetery. It's an old parish. It's, it's, it's the second oldest parish in the Archdiocese of Detroit. It's founded, or at least begun, let's say, in 1832. Oh, the records are kind of scant at that time. Uh, it was founded in a, a woods area, and it was a, a, a wooden structure. It was a little wood cabin that was the first parish. It was alongside Gratiot Avenue, uh, which was a connecting point between downtown Detroit at the river and Port Huron. So it was a connecting point, and the and the, and the people of that place just built us a little chapel, uh, uh, wood logs, to have a little uh, place of prayer, and it eventually became our parish. So it's an old parish, an historic parish. Um, we are, of course, in a city that's very well known to be uh, in a depressed state right now. And, uh, but we are, thank God, uh, thriving. And um, it's because I think it has this long history, it has these deep roots. And because we are, let's say, of a traditional uh, bent. So we offer um, a number of things that favor uh, tradition. We, we have a lot of homeschool families. We have uh, the liturgy in a very traditional way in Latin often. Uh, we have Gregorian chant and choirs, and we have a beautiful Gothic structure. which is the fourth building on that site, <coughs> built in 1929. Um, and uh, so even though Detroit itself is suffering a lot, our parish is, is doing well. So I have another associate priest with me, for the, uh, another diocesan priest, and an order of priests, uh, the Canons of the Holy Cross, um, who assist me uh, when they're in town on weekends. Uh, otherwise, they are busy giving parish missions uh, various places uh, throughout the world, actually. They're an international order. So uh, it's a thriving parish. We are a small parish, relatively speaking, only some uh, 700 families. Uh, but uh, we're doing well, thank God, and uh, we have, uh, I attribute this success to uh, those traditional things, as well as, I must have to say this, of course, uh, the patronage of the Blessed Mother. Because this is a Marian parish, but this is Assumption Grotto. It's a parish in honor of her Assumption into Heaven. So all of these things uh, you know, have kind of worked together uh, to make uh, a truly unique place because uh, of its uh, rather central location. We have people coming from all sides of the metropolitan area of Detroit uh, to worship there and to find fellowship and consolation, uh, which comes principally from God, but also is mediated you know, through the church and through the liturgy and the experience of belonging in a parish family. So that's kind of the background of, of uh, I've been there um, now some, oh gosh, it's uh, going on uh, 20 years. 20 uh, years. Maybe next year will be 20 years, so it's 19 years uh, as pastor. So that's pretty much our story of how the, what, what the parish is and, and where I am in it. Okay, let's, I want to start back uh, with your vocation. Uh, first of all, let's talk about your family life, um, where you grew up, uh, your mother and father, your parent, or your brothers and sisters, to understand how our Lord led you to this vocation. 
locations are are hard to track. Okay. You know, back tracking. <clears throat> um, we can sometimes find signal moments. Um, my, uh, of course, my my both my parents are Catholics, and um, I went to Catholic school, Catholic grade school, our parish school, St. Clair Montefiore School in Gross Point, and um, we. Um, I went to Catholic high school for one year at the LaSalle High School, Christian okay. Brothers School. Um, everyone uh, was practicing the faith in our family, thank heavens, and uh, all my relatives we were all Catholics um, brought up in the faith. And then um, I had an interest in music because my father was a musician, so I left off the Catholic schools and went to Cass Tech School in Detroit, which was a, you know, it was, it was a great school in its, in its heyday studied music and then went on to college to study music. So when I was a little boy and already in second grade, I know I knew I, I had a deep interest in religion. And I remember drawing pictures, uh, religious pictures and writing little musical pieces for church, little curies and things like that. Uh, I mean, they're very primitive, I'm sure. I don't but have them anymore. But you were writing. I was writing a little bit of music at that time. And, um, and then, uh, so music took over. And I went to University of Louisville and got a degree in music and composition. And then my last year, I had this thought that flashed through my head that I, I think I'd like to be a priest. And the next day, I woke up and I said, oh, that was a foolish thought. <laughs> so it, it came. See, it was in my boyhood. Uh, and then it came back once in college. And then when I returned back home after my studies in music, I went to work at Old St. Mary's Church down in Greektown. And it was there that the idea really came <clears throat> strong, that I wanted to be a priest. And I uh, didn't know how my family would take it, because they were rather sure I was going to be a musician, and of course so was I. And so I went to take some classes at Sacred Heart Seminary, but I didn't live there. And I didn't tell anyone about this. It was just kind of a secret thing I, I did. I wanted to make sure that this is what I wanted to do. How old were you at the time? Oh, uh, well, this would have been, I would have been 20 one, twenty-two years old at that okay. time. So I uh, took these classes, already had my undergraduate degree in music, and decided that I would take the entrance exam, a psychological exam, and an aptitude exam uh, for uh, seminary. When I, as soon as I had the results of that, that I had passed that, and I was clear, then I told my parents that I wanted to enter the seminary. And so I did. The following year went into um, St. John Seminary in Plymouth, Michigan, and completed the course, and was ordained in 1978 for the Archdiocese of Detroit. Okay. Now, how did you? How did your parents react when you told them? Um, my dad pulled me aside and he said, um, "You know, he said for me, the way to go is family." And he was very forthright about it, very kind about it. Just, but he he made it clear that um, okay. that it wasn't. It wasn't what he would do with his life, but he respected and he said that he would support me. Surprisingly, my mother uh, was um, not so uh, agreeable to it, or so accepting of it. Um, but she got over that, and um, and uh, they never tried to put up any obstacle to it. But um, um, so in the end, they were ac accepting and supportive, and um, my uncle. The day I moved into seminary, I brought in a lot of music books, you know, music scores and you know, recordings and things. He says, I don't know why we're doing this. He said, I, it's going to be before the end of the year and we'll be moving you out. I mean, <laughs> didn't have that much confidence that I was going to actually go through with the whole thing. But uh, okay. thank God I persevered through a very difficult seminary experience. Difficult not because I was having trouble with the studies or anything, but uh, difficult because it was a very liberal time. Uh, at the church. This, these were the, the late 70s, uh, mid 70s, I should say, and um, the church was going through this crisis of which, you know, Opus Sacerdoti uh, became a part of necessity. So um, that was, we can talk about that. Father, we were just talking about um, your family life. Um, talk about your mother and father. Uh, what were their names? I always like to make sure that, uh, because they get credit to this, and how did they um, teach you your faith. A lot of times parents nowadays, you know, they raise, they send them to Catholic school, but they don't teach them their faith, and so they end up losing the faith. Right, that's certainly true. Um, my father 
was brought up in an orphanage because um, my grandmother had died. So he had a good grounding in the faith there because of the sisters uh, who taught him. Um, my mother had the usual Catholic education, uh, grade school education. Uh, she went to catechism class, she went to public school. Um, and as far as we were concerned, we went to Catholic grade school, as I mentioned. And part of that, in those days, was learning the Baltimore Catechism from road, you know, by road. And those lessons would have to be reinforced at home. So my mother had to do a little bit of, um, you know, training um, uh, at home, reviewing the questions. So we had all of that. And of course, they were all very, um, you know, we were a practicing family. We all went to church. And uh, so they were involved in the faith, I would say. Um, but in an ordinary way. It wasn't thing, anything extraordinary. We were not extraordinarily devout. My father, every night, would say his prayers daily at the foot of the bed, which made a deep impression on me as we used to pass by, you know, going to the bathroom at the last minute, as children do. My father was always kneeling there. Uh, and that was something that inspired me, because I knew he was praying for us, always praying for the family, providing for us. So those are indicators, you know, that, that this is a Catholic home, that we took the faith seriously, but I wouldn't say we were overtly uh, devout. We had a little statue of the Blessed Mother in the home and the crucifix and the Bible and the usual things. So it was an ordinary thing. Um, so uh, the Catholic faith was just part of life. We just lived it and we just took it in stride. Okay. Uh, let's go back to uh, the seminary now. Uh, what were your experiences? What was going on? You mentioned that it was a uh, liberal time. Uh, where do we go? Well, um, in these days, 1973 to <coughs> 77, uh, and a little beyond that, the seminary, St. John Seminary in Plymouth, Michigan, was prided, prided itself on being the most liberal seminary in the country. Now, whether or not they actually deserved that discredit, uh, I don't know, but uh, that's how they like to think of themselves. So um, these were times when everything was being called into question. This was in the wake of Humanae Vitae. We're still in the pontificate of Pope Paul VI, the days after Vatican Council. Uh, a lot of the professors were challenging church teachings, dogmas even. Uh, they were being reinterpreted. Um, we had a lot of Protestant theology. We had some visitors uh, giving us Jewish perspectives on things of faith. And uh, so it was all rather confusing because we were never sure, we were never taught anyway, what is the Catholic position. It's okay to have a, a grounding in other things, and so you can kind of contrast the Catholic faith with those other ways, uh, but always with a view to seeing why the Catholic Church believes this to be the true teaching, to have the truth. Uh, that was never done. So we're kind of left in the dark. Um, and the other aspects of the seminary, too. There, there was not a lot of discipline. Um, the seminarians could stay out overnight, or they could, even weekends, we were not obliged to be there, uh, which was good for me because I, I was playing the organ in the church on the weekend. I had a job, so it gave me some <laughs> income. You know, it was, I wasn't about to buck that. Um, on the other hand, I think it was bad for seminary. Um, but given the liberal time it was, I think it was good that I was able to get out. So I did work at Old St. Mary's Church as organist in Detroit. And that not only gave me an income, but gave me a contact with, as I say, a more ordinary form of uh, Catholic faith and piety. So it was good for me to have done that. But that experience of being in the seminary at that time, with all the confusion, um, feeds into what the Opus Bono Sacerdoti is about, because it was the era of liberalism that caused the confusion in priests' minds about what priestly identity is and about what church teachings are and their binding power, not only in matters of faith, but also in liturgy and even in the moral life. So everything was being called into question. A uh, few things were stated as absolutes. So the moral life of the faithful, you know, whether we're bound by God's commandments, specifically in regard to, to chastity, uh, all that was taken rather lightly, I would say. Um, at least to this, in the sense that nothing was absolutely held as certain. So with that kind of mindset and uh, coming from that kind of seminary background, I understand what happened in the priesthood. 
uh, and understand that it was not just a matter of certain priests misbehaving uh, that caused this crisis in the priesthood, but rather this was something that it was being fed from a number of sources into the whole stream of the Catholic priesthood, uh, accounting for the crisis that eventually blew up and, and necessitated this great work that, that they're doing at Opus Bono. Okay, so you have all these priests, young men, that are going into the seminary, and they think they're going to get good theology, and they're devout, and all of a sudden, what were you thinking in the first year when you're hearing all this? Did you know that it was wrong? Or? I did. I, I had the good fortune of having a friend, uh, a layman, who was a Thomist, in other words, a, a follower of St. Thomas Aquinas, brilliant man, a philosopher, a kind of a very unusual character. Talked about, I could talk about him for a long time, but his name was Nick, Nick Sias, and he knew St. Thomas chapter and verse, as it were. He could quote him uh, at length, but he not only understood St. Thomas, he could apply St. Thomas to the present day. Well, he helped clarify a number of things that were misstated in the in the, my seminary teaching. And he would say, don't read that book, read this book, or this is the correct teaching, and that's, that's false. That plus the Catholic background that I'd had, although we all shared that because my contemporaries were all basically my, the same age as myself, but also the devotion to Mary, and that, you know, she has, Our Lady has a very special place in keeping orthodoxy, in keeping true faith, and of course, in the moral life, right? She's, she's you know, the, the, the inspiration of things theological and things spiritual. So those two things, my, my, out, my friend from the outside who was kind of coaching me in the wings, as it were, plus Our Lady's uh, intercession, which I, I rely on because I was consecrated to her already at that time, those things kind of kept me from falling in to this um, stream of uh, confusion uh, but I won't say I, I came out unscathed. Uh, I, there was confusion, and uh, Father Hardin's great catechism uh, helped me to uh, help clarify a lot of things that were very confusing in those in those. Because you never learned them. Because I never learned them or learned them with clarity. They, they were they were there. We covered all the subjects, uh, but it wasn't. I wasn't really sure of how the pieces fit together and how the Catholic uh, position, if I can call it that, or I'll just say truth, uh, was was to be made out of all that mix of, of ideas that were given to us. Did, were there a lot of seminarians that left the seminary because of they just weren't being fed? Uh, a number of them did drop out. Uh, some of them dropped out already in the diaconate um, and never went on to the priesthood, which was to their credit, I would say, that they could see that either for personal reasons or that the church was how it should be, uh, they decided to, to quit. Um, some of them went on to the priesthood, uh, left in the course of the priesthood, um, and then a few of us, uh, you know, stayed on in my class. I'm speaking of only of my class. So, um, yeah, I think, I think they, they run a whole range. Okay. Did you have a lot of discussions, I shouldn't say discussions, um, issues with the professors? If you knew they were wrong and they wanted a certain thing on a paper, you know, even I experienced that in, in college. They're trying to make you write down what you know is wrong. So how did that work in, in the seminary when it should be the one way? I'll tell you how I solved the problem. <clears throat> if, if you didn't get through the seminary successfully, of course, you would never be ordained. Those hands would never be placed over your head. So it was a kind of game. It was a kind of um, dangerous game. But I had to answer on paper the things that were given to me in class with this kind of mental, mental reservation that I'm not really answering these doctrinal questions as the church teaches them. I'm answering them according to the classes and the way, the mode of, of, of teaching that we were given. So I, I was only, as I say, reporting what, what was given to me, not what I believed was true. So in that way, I, was, I succeeded in getting through the courses. But as far as the teachers are concerned, uh, I had to wait until I passed all my classes individually, until I took the comprehensive examination in theology, which is at the end of all the studies, and that I had approval by the faculty for orders. Those three things had to come together. The day that 
the last of those, and I don't remember what was the last, I think it was a comprehensive exam. The day that the last of those was completed, I went to my typewriter and I typed a seven page letter to the worst offender on the faculty, who was a disciple of Hans Krum, and uh, a priest. And I knocked on his door and I said, I have, a, I have a letter for you. And he said, you do? I said, yes. He says, who's it from? I said, it's a letter from me to you. He looked a little troubled. He opened the door, sat me down nervously, and I said, I just want to tell you this. I said, I don't want you to interrupt me. I said, I have, I'm going to read this whole letter to you. I said, and you can speak afterwards. So I went through and I talked about every aspect of seminar life. First of all, his classes, the doctrines that he misrepresented, the way he conducted the liturgy in sometimes a mocking fashion, uh, the sermons that he gave, uh, his uh, dealing with, dealings with the seminarians, uh, everything. And uh, he was, of course, very upset uh, when it was over, but he basically honored my conditions, and then he dismissed me uh, in a huff, and, um, and that was that. So I did have that opportunity, and I took advantage of it. And I also presented that paper to the rector, um, the letter, and he knew what I was doing. And uh, But it, it was a vindication. I felt I had to do it, not just uh, to, to vent, as it were, you know, my own feelings and my own uh, frustration that I'd kept quiet all those years, but to justify, to, to have the faith speak uh, in, in that moment. This, by the way, this priest is subsequently married, left the priesthood. Um, so, uh, in fact, the whole faculty is a, is a disaster. I, there's only, off the top of my head now, one priest that's still a, a practicing priest in another diocese. So, uh, although there may be more, I'm just trying to re re recollect. So, it was a very troubled time. Um, the faculty, the students, the, 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 my fellow seminarians, a lot of confusion, a lot of anger, uh, because truth doesn't make you happy. When you hear things that you know are not right and you're oppressed in, in, by, by what is being taught, it creates a, a very unhappy uh, reaction in, in a person. So we were all unhappy, we all complained about the seminary, but for different reasons. The liberals, it wasn't liberal enough, or, were, or they were complaining about Catholic teaching, that, that still was residual with them. And then, of course, uh, those who were like myself uh, knew that it was wrong, not always knowing exactly what was wrong with it, but uh, frustrated that we weren't given all that we knew we should have gotten as seminarians, as, as men being prepared for a holy calling. Okay, so that's interesting that you said that this is really the groundwork of what all the problems are today in the church, or most of the problems with it. Do you still see some of these priests? Do you have contact with them, or the ones that have left the priesthood? And I'm thinking about, um, the reason I'm asking is, I, I want to find out if there's any way that we can help re-evangelize them to, you know, to come, do, do any of them change their mind? You know, understand what had happened and, you know, that they went on the wrong road. I can't say that there was a lot of interaction there. Uh, after ordination, and that may be more typical than, than unusual. Uh, you know, once you're ordained a priest, you're at work in your parish, and your your, your family, your, yeah. your contacts are substantially your parishioners. At least that's that's been my experience. Uh, in the olden days, before Vatican Council days, when seminary life was much tight, tighter, and uh, there was a greater fraternity, because they were all captive in that institution. They had to stay there. They had to, you know, they, they, they worked together, they studied together, they played together. Um, it was all very close and the rules were tight. So uh, the camaraderie was greater. So I think they kept up a number of relations with each other uh, over the years of their priesthood uh, more than we did because we were allowed to leave and we didn't have to have that close fraternity, uh, which they've now since tried to recover in, the, uh, in our time now. Um, I think that we were a little bit less communicative with one another. So I wouldn't say that I had a lot of contact with uh, uh, my, f my, uh, my priests, my, my fellow priests in the diocese uh, a great deal. And, uh, but I, I think that's unfortunate. But given the liberal uh, practices 
and teaching that ensued from our training, uh, I wouldn't have had much in common anyway. Okay. So you survived the uh, seminary. Where were, where's your first uh, assignment? My first assignment was in St. Peter's Church in Mount Clemens, Michigan. Um, I was associate, of course, uh, to the pastor, Father Welch. Uh, it was a, a very challenging uh, first assignment. Um, we had all those liberal elements in the church that I was very well familiar with now were present in that parish. There was a lot of struggle uh, for establishing a radical catechesis, which means not doctrinal, um, challenging church teaching, the liturgy. There was an element, uh, although it wasn't from the pastor, that wanted uh, a lot of radical kinds of things. Uh, the folk mass group uh, kind of uh, um, held forth there and, 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 and with their prayer groups and their various ways of praying and non-traditional expression. So uh, there was struggle in the parish, uh, particularly in religious education, and so I was brought right into that. So it was, it was a difficult assignment, but very rewarding. I, I still know some of those people from my first assignment some 35 years ago. Uh, I'm still in touch with some of them and see their families now, you know, they're, they're grown up and they, they have children. And, uh, so it, it, it's, it's paid off and it's a very gratifying thing. Okay. Uh, Father, you have something going on this summer? Uh, some spiritual event going? Uh, we certainly do. Every summer, in fact, uh, we have our patronal feast day, August 15th, the Assumption of Mary into Heaven. And um, this year, as every other year, since time immemorial, perhaps, uh, the, of the parish's history, we will have uh, special events all day long, uh, culminating in an evening mass with a uh, candlelight procession, as they do in Lourdes, France, because it is a as a Marian shrine, outdoor shrine of Our Lady of Lourdes, and uh, people come from all over the Detroit area to join in prayer that day, invoking Mary's uh, special patronage and in giving her honor uh, that is her due. So it's a, it's a great day. We have events, as I said, throughout the day, not only masses, confessions, stations, rosaries. Uh, there are religious goods for sale. Uh, we serve some meals there. Uh, there uh, there's a healing of the sick, uh, the anointing of the sick, I should say, and a uh, benediction of the Blessed Sacrament. So there, there's just about something to do throughout the entire day of starting at the 6.30 Mass in the morning. Terrific. Okay, let's, uh, we were just talking about your first assignment in, um, where was it again? St. Peter's, St. Peter's in Mount Clements, yes. Okay, then where did you go after that? After that I went to a um, parish in Livonia, Michigan, uh, St. Genevieve, and uh, that was a wonderful experience, a very strong, uh, strong-willed pastor, Father Wolber, uh, now deceased, and uh, he taught me a great deal. He was a tough guy. He had been in the service during the war. Uh, he um, was a very decisive man, um, excellent administrator. But um, among the things, and we got along fabulously well, even though we're very different temperaments, um, it was in that parish that for the first time, due to a prayer group that uh, began, a rosary prayer group for college students, um, the uh, protests, as it was in those days, at abortion clinics. So I started a little cynical group of these young people, and it was their idea, it wasn't certainly to my credit, that we go to protest at abortion clinics by carrying signs. And now this is the early days of, of, the, uh, of this kind of activity. So we didn't yet have the, the sidewalk counseling techniques that were developed later. All we knew is that we had to do something and so it was the idea of the public protest of abortion. So there, the young people led me there. I said, there I was carrying a sign uh, along the street. Never thought I'd be doing that kind of a thing. A uh, sign saying, you know, abortion kills babies. And they had the usual kinds of uh, pictures that were rather graphic. And we just walked, because that was part of the, the rules of, the, of, of this kind of a protest so on a public walkway, saying the rosary over and over again. So that's how um, that my involvement in that kind of work got started, and it was to the credit of the young people for getting me involved in it. Okay, and when did you arrive at Assumption Grotto? Then uh, I was pastor for a little bit, uh, for seven years actually, in a country parish in Cape Michigan, 
a rural parish, a very nice experience, uh, very different from being in the city. And then I came to Assumption Grotto in 1994, and uh, I've been there as pastor uh, ever since. Okay. Let's talk about your involvement with Opus Bono. How well, did this get started? Uh, Opus Bono got started um, because in our parish, a priest who was in residence but not assigned there from Africa, uh, from Togo, uh, Father Felicien Onjame, was uh, accused uh, by a woman of some inappropriate behaviors. And um, when this came to my attention, uh, I could see that she was going to pursue this. She was going to go public with her allegation. So I, I knew that this priest would be in trouble, even though he wasn't a diocesan priest, even though he wasn't, he, he was a great friend. Uh, he's a wonderful human being um, and, a, and a very devoted priest. I knew we had to do something to help him, uh, not only for his sake, but even for the parish's sake, because this would certainly get into the news. Now, this is all before all of these cases of um, priests. Uh, yes, all the, 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 the um, priests, the problem broke out. So this was kind of, uh, this, is, this is very new, shocking, as it always is, even today, but uh, all the more so because it, this, was, this was an unheard of thing. So uh, we had to go, we dragged through the usual business, the, the, the media, and uh, we had to get an attorney to defend him. But we had no money, and this priest had none, and, um, and it wasn't something I could support to the parish. Uh, so I didn't know where to turn, and uh, a parishioner, Joe Maher, who is, of course, uh, now heading up this great work in Opus Bono Sacerdotsi, I turned to Joe and I said, Joe, we have to do something to help Father Felician. And I explained what had happened to him, and uh, it was from that crisis, really, a uh, parochial need to help a priest uh, that was in a, in a sore spot that Opus Bono Sacerdotsi was, was born. It, it wasn't called that. Initially, we had to just do the immediate things of getting an attorney who finally did take the case, um, uh, Mr. Grimm, um, and we are grateful indeed for, for what he did because uh, in the end, uh, Father was, was found not guilty of the charges, but it was, it was a painful experience. And uh, of course, it was shortly thereafter that the, the crisis broke out across the country and we were prepared. We already had this test case uh, uh, of, a, of a priest being being tried, and so Opus Bono was was uh, born out of that, and we already had an idea of how we were going to approach it with uh, assisting a priest in, in, in a troubled situation. What did you think when the so the the woman came to you first? She did. Okay. She did. She came to me and told me what she. Um, had experienced in her words. Uh, I was very troubled by it because I, I valued this priest's friendship very highly. Uh, as I said, he was an extraordinary, and is uh, an extraordinary person. Uh, very kind, very giving, very friendly, very uh, lovable person. And so I, I had the weighty uh, office of going to tell him what I thought uh, he would have admitted. And I told him what she said, and his <laughs> jaw dropped, and he just was unbelieving of what he was hearing. I, and I didn't think he would have lied to me. I, I was telling him, expecting him to admit, admit it, and then I would have to deal with uh, this difficult situation. But uh, that wasn't the case. So I, w I was happy. I was relieved that that, that was his response, uh, although he, he, I didn't pry into, you know, details of what happened. He knew the woman, of course. Uh, she belonged to the parish. But um, I, I was happy about that, but then I told him uh, this is going to be a long and difficult uh, battle now because this is going to be... Okay. All right. We have a caller, Mike from Lima, Ohio. Mike, what's your question for Father today? Good. How are you, Mike?
Thank you, Mike. Heather? Sure. I, I hate to say it, but I, I think the bishops are trying to cover for themselves financially um, in, in just removing a priest. It seems to be the easy thing to do. I mean, the, you know, the bishops did meet on this and, and came up with a policy. Uh, I think it's unfortunate the way it was done myself. I don't mean to be critical of the bishops uh, uh, particularly, but I think they, they acted under pressure. They, they could see the, the media uh, was eager to, to gobble up this news to accuse the priest. The Catholic Church, of course, is a great target, and the priesthood would be the way to go after the church. So um, I think the, the way they decided they would handle it is just remove the priest from the parish, from the situation where there would be tension. I can understand that, of course. Um, the, the priest would be um, already held in suspicion by the, by the parishioners. He would have people for and against him, so they decided to remove him. However, uh, you, uh, you're quite right in saying that you know the suspicion against a priest is since to be automatically uh, moved towards being guilty. Uh, that's a kind of problem with our human nature, uh, fallen nature, that especially those the higher up they are, as soon as we hear something that is uh, alleged uh, wrong, that we, we tend to be believing of it. And that shouldn't be the case. Uh, we, I think we should give everybody the benefit of the doubt. But that isn't how things turned out, uh, as we know. And, and there was an eager uh, desire to, to denigrate the priest, to, to criticize priests. So I, I think it was unfortunate the way it was handled, but I, I kind of understand it because priests are held uh, at least were uh, held in very high esteem by an, by the faithful. Okay, well, thank you again, Mike, for that call. In the case of Father Felice, Felician. Felician, he was not a diocesan priest. Correct. What? How did things work with the diocese today? When you informed them what was going on, or did she inform them first, or how did that work? Um, the diocese got into it, of course, right at the beginning to this extent, that they clarified that they would not support him uh, legally, financially, or in any other way because he did not belong to them. So they wanted to dissociate themselves from him in any way. Um, and uh, so the diocese really left us alone. Um, and I'm not blaming them for that. I, I just, I don't think, again, no one knew exactly how to handle this thing, and it clearly wasn't their problem. Uh, but it was in the sense that it was one of their parishes, and a priest who, although not a diocesan priest, uh, had been working in a parish, and, and I'm glad they allowed him to work in the parish. He was a great help to me. Uh, but um, I, I think they just didn't know what else to do. So I think they just uh, basically um, had no contact, no association. But even after he was acquitted, they made it clear to me that he would not be allowed to come back and serve in the parish. Okay, where did he go? Where is he now? Uh, he is <clears throat> somewhere out in Las Vegas. Uh, he's not been given priestly faculties, uh, even though, as I say, he was acquitted by the court. Uh, nobody seems to have wanted to take him on. It's just too hot a thing to handle, I think, for, for most bishops. So I think it's unfortunate he's a, he's a talented man, dedicated priest, uh, has a lot of wisdom, uh, works wonderfully with children, uh, a winning personality in, in just about every way, but uh, he's uh, unable to, to operate publicly as a priest. He says his private mass uh, every day, and uh, he's a prayerful person, but he's working some secular job. Okay, so that's how he supports himself. Right. One of the questions um, that I, I had, when, when Father said, no, I didn't do that, how do you know at that time that he didn't do that? I mean, it's because it's, people, people are just good liars sometimes. So how did you know whether he was really telling the truth or not? Um, actually, I don't really know what happened. Um, I confronted him after this woman had made this um, accusation uh, with, the, with the story. Uh, he recalled the day and event that, that 
this or where this allegedly took place. Um, but he was completely surprised at the sequence of, of the event. And I was expecting him, because he's such a spontaneous person, he's a very, uh, he, he wears his heart in his sleeve kind of person. I think had I accused him and he had been guilty, he would have shown on his face in some way. Uh, you know, either right. blanched or uh, his mouth would have dropped or something, but he, he was, he, he was surprised at, at what he heard. Okay. And, and it was so genuine, it was so natural a reaction that I, 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 I believed him. And, and that's why I was immediately relieved. Now, and again, to this day, I don't know exactly what happened. Uh, I never um, questioned him anymore about it. I, the process was now going to take its own life in the, in the legal arena. This would be something that they have to be fact-finding and all of the usual stuff that takes place in a legal proceeding. So I, I wasn't uh, any more interested in it in that way. My job now was to, to protect my parishioners, to calm them down, to help them understand this thing in a spiritual way. Okay. What is your role currently with Opus Bono? Well, I'm their spiritual advisor, and uh, I, um, I, I'm, as I say, I, I, I'm consulted when there's a, an issue regarding uh, the priests, or about the, the general movement of the of the organization. Um, I, I was much more involved in it in the initial stages, of course, uh, getting a spiritual direction set um, for the whole movement, and. Um, involved in the, the philosophy and what, what form that would take. Uh, in other words, how we would be approaching the church and uh, getting support in the sense of not financial support here, but getting the sympathies of priests and trying to understand this from a priestly point of view. So I was, I would say, more involved in the initial stages than I am now in the, the data operation, which I, I am not so involved. Okay, does the diocese familiar with you're being involved with Opus Bono because Opus Bono is completely separate from any organization, any church organization, or under the auspices of the Catholic Church. That's right. It's entirely independent <clears throat> of the of the church officially. Uh, it it's uh, it's just run by uh, lay people. Uh, again, I'm only advising the uh, Opus Bono. Uh, so um, the church, you know, benefits from what we're doing. Um, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't give it the support um, except, you know, in a, in a spiritual sense and prayer and some bishops are very open about their support for the, for the work that, that we're doing for the priests. Um, but we're, we're not, it's not a, and it doesn't seek to be an official uh, part of the church structure because the whole point of this is to be a counterpoint to a movement which is also outside the church, a movement of dissent and uh, against the priesthood. So it's better that it's not involved in the official structures of the church and merely comes to the aid of priests who are in need of, of the services that Opus Bono provides. Do you go out and, and, and search out some of the bishops to talk with them and, and kind of present Opus Bono? I don't do it myself. Uh, that's Joe Maher's work and uh, as far as I know and He's been uh, extremely uh, well received by many bishops. Uh, he's very good at what he does. Joe has a very affable personality, <laughs> and uh, uh, he, uh, he knows how to treat things lightly when they need to be, uh, he, and to be serious when he also needs to be. So uh, he's a talented person. He has this good personality. He has a love for the church, love for the priesthood, and uh, he seems to have a good know-how. And, how to adapt. When he doesn't know what to do, he knows how to, um, uh, what shall I say, vamp and find his <laughs> way. And he's just a very talented person, he's very successful at it. So you need this kind of person, personality thing, person who's uh, intense in, a, in an interior way, but an outside a very relaxed and friendly way, so that it, it looks as though he's, he's taking all this thing uh, without a deep um, worry, uh, but yet I think he carries that part uh, interiorly. So he's, he's very much involved in it without being uh, unduly uh, somber 
uh, about 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 thing, even though it's terribly yeah. serious. Joe yeah. is not a somber person in the least. In any sense, right? Yeah, yeah that's right. Um, well, we have a few more minutes left. Um, what uh, do you have? Any problems with people contacting you and saying, "Why are you doing this? You're just as bad as the priests that are abusing people." And do you get persecuted? I guess is what I'm getting to. Actually, I I don't get persecuted for that. Uh, I do have. There are some people, and perhaps some priests. Although I, I think priests tend to be more sympathetic. There are some people who who look down on this work. Of course, because either they have been personally affected by uh, persons who have been abused by priests, um, or they just or they're against priests and the church in general. Uh, so we've had that kind of uh, I've had that kind of reaction, but not so much myself as I say because I'm not so much involved in the, the day to day operation. So uh, I would say, as far as my personal um, involvement in that kind of uh, tension, uh, I would say it's not been very great. I, I've been um, I've been more opposed for being quote a traditional okay. priest. A conservative, <laughs> okay. doctrinally, liturgically, and but people don't understand that. How can a priest who's uh, of the old school, how can he possibly uh, be supporting, uh, or seem to be supporting, uh, priests who have done some terrible things? Okay, well, we have a few, about a minute left. Uh, we'll be back uh, next Thursday, or Thursday, July 11th at 12 p.m. Be sure to listen to the archived versions of our shows. At Father, uh, you do, you wrote a prayer for Opus Bono. I was wondering if you could read the final prayer for the prayer for for priests and sure. uh, give us your blessing at the end. Thank Certainly. you. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord Jesus Christ, eternal High Priest, and exemplar of priestly holiness and dignity, we are grateful to you for having chosen certain men for the ministerial priesthood, by which you continue to instruct admonish, forgive, nourish, and strengthen your church. We are sorely aware of the great need of priests in our time to be confirmed in their sacred calling, so that they may continue confidently in their ministry of mediating your graces to men and of representing them before your august majesty. Relying on the intercession of Holy Mary, Mother of Priests, and of St. Joseph, her beloved spouse, we beg your help for the priests who are the most troubled, tempted, discouraged, and suffering. May the noble and sacred office of the priesthood, which has too often been reviled and scorned, regain its admirable stature in the sight of all men for your greater honor and glory and for the sanctification and salvation of your people. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.